everyone and welcome. It's Bible study time. Super excited about coming forth. Y'all, I got my janky glasses on today. Don't pay no attention. Uh, super for, super excited about coming forward with a thought-provoking Bible study for you all today. Today, we're going to be speaking out of the book of Jonah. We're going to be talking about Jonah and his travels after he got a command from God and what where he ended up and what led him there. We're going to be speaking to chapter one of Jonah, Jonah, the book of Jonah. And uh, I'm just going to get to it. So let's invoke the spirit of God in helping me in the discernment of God's word. Heavenly Father, I come before you in love, looking for you through the many pages of, these, of this book. I ask that you use me, you lessen me, and magnify you through me. And use me as your vessel to interpret your word and convey it unto the children. I love you so deeply and I thank you for all that you are, all that you have been, and all that you will always be. In God's name I pray, amen. All right. Okay, y'all. So we're going to speak to Jonah. So let's get started. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up to me. But Jonah rose up to flee and to tarnish from the presence of the Lord. He left, he, he ran away and went down to Joppa and said, and, excuse me, and went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to tarnish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them to tarnish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God cast, and cast forth their wares that were in the ship unto the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we may not perish. And they said, Everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots that we may know for, for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto them, tell us, we pray thee for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation and whence comest thou and what is thy country and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven which hath made the sea and the dry land. When, then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto him, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake... This great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the man rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not. For the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the man feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. All right, y'all. So, uh, you know, the story goes, as I just stated to you, that God had came to Jonah and told him to do something, gave him a command. And Jonah, knowing the history of God working through his people, because God has worked through the Hebrews, the Hebrews tremendously, uh, if not exclusively. And he ran and he fled because he didn't want to be bothered. He didn't want to be bothered with the, all that comes with doing God's work in the earth amongst these children. It wasn't that God didn't love, it wasn't that Jonah didn't love God. It was the fact that Jonah knows through the reputation of his own people, how they are amongst one another, how they have been to all the prophets that have come before them. 
in the past that this is not an easy job to do God's work in the earth, to be the vessel or the ambassador of God in the earth amongst these children. So God said, no, I'm going, I'm out of here. God's going to have to find me. Either he's going to take the time to find me or he's going to go find somebody else because I'm out of here. And he hops on a boat. And he hops on a boat with a number of other people that have nothing to do with his situation or his calling. Thinking, because it says later, it says in the book that, it says here in chapter 4, verse 2, where he speaks to the nature of God and that he knows the nature of God. He says, Thou art a gracious God and a merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of evil. So he knows that God is not going to destroy his innocent children just so he can punish one. That's not the nature of this God. Many people look at God as this wrathful, vindictive uh, God that will do will lay everybody down just because of one person's uh, inconsistency or one person's evil. That is not the nature of God. And so this is why Jonah hopped on this boat, you guys. Jonah hopped on the boat amongst the righteous because he wanted to get away from a calling that God had came to him and gave him. And he used the safety of the righteous to try and... Uh, hide himself or protect himself from God within. And God sent the sea and God sent, you know, all of the elements against those on the boat to cause an upheaval in that environment. But isn't that how God works? God sent the elements to cause an upheaval within that environment. And when everybody was in chaos and, and running around trying to throw things off of the boat to salvage the boat, panicking, uh, uh, really in a chaotic moment, where was Jonah? It says in the Bible that Jonah was on the side of the boat. It says, but Jonah was gone down onto the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. This, is, this goes back to what I said about the nature of God and Jonah knowing the nature of God and actually trying to use it against God. That's really what he was doing. If you look at it fundamentally from, the, from a fundamental perspective, his thought process was, I'm not worried about this because I know the nature of God. I know I'm on the boat with these innocent people that have nothing to do with this. And I'm going to use the fact that these people are innocent and have nothing to do with this against God to protect me and to get my will done. That's exactly what he was doing. And the shipmaster comes down there and asks him, what are you doing down here sleep? What is your problem? You need to wake up and help us get this, this ship together or else we'll sink. You need to start praying. You need to start doing something. And it sparked curiosity in the shipmaster's mind. He's saying, oh, something's wrong here. This is the only person that's not panicked. We're all panicked on this boat. And this is the one person not panicked. He knows something we don't. Same as Jesus when he was on the boat with the disciples in the raging sea. He knew something that the disciples did not. Jonah knew this as well. And it created curiosity amongst all those that were on the ship once they got word of it. It doesn't say that in the Bible, but you have to use your imagination to act, to put yourself in that situation. Everybody's panicked. The shipmaster comes and sees him, and he's the only one sleeping. So what do they do? What do they do? I'll show you. The next verse after that comes and he says, verse seven, and they said, everyone to his fellow, come, 
and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell upon Jonah. You know, this is really why I decided to do the Bible study on Jonah because many people do the Bible study on Jonah and the belly of the, of the whale and all that kind of stuff. But really, this is the reason why I decided to do this. Because see, friend, in drastic times, in hard times, when it's when it's metal to the pedal, rubber meet the road times, you don't go for things that you hope will work. Regardless to if they're righteous or unrighteous. You're not sitting there in a, you know, morality clause type of scenario. You're not wrestling with the morality of things. Oh, is this the right thing to do? Is this not the right thing to do? They had to get some facts quickly. These people are in a ship. It's tumultuous, tempestuous. There's, the winds are raging. The waters are raging. They're throwing stuff off the boat. None of them, hard, most of them don't even know themselves, know, know each other because all of them pay to get on this boat. So it's not like they all have a history. You got all kinds of people on this one vessel, Jonah included. And it's a life or death situation. And in those situations, you don't lean on new tools. You lean on the tried and the true friend. And that's what they did. They cast lots. What are casting lots? It's a form of divination. At, at its most fundamental aspect. It is a form of divination. Some more powerful than others. You got divination through uh, uh, dice. You can use dice. Some people, because when I Googled it, I came up with dice. But I guess you could use dice. You could use uh, different nuts in numerical systems. Odu, the uh, Ifa have a, a system which is called the Odu. You have cards. You could use to act as divination uh, uh, ways to use of divination. You got the Ephod. Even the the Israel's had a holy Ephod that they used as a, div a tool of divination. This is what they used. And it says it here in the Bible, and you see casting lots often in the Bible. When you see casting lots, you're talking about a form of divination, literally. I'd like somebody to tell me different and explain to me something different because I know it to be a form of divination, to be able to use natural elements, to be able to see into a thing, to give you clarity about uh, future prospects, things going on now, and how to uh, approach things effectively uh, within the world in your on your behalf. And not even really on your behalf, to be able to see into the future of po future possibilities of things. And it goes even deeper than that. It can, it can even go deeper than that. But that's just the fundamental description of what divination is. So they were using a form of divination. They were casting lots and the lot fell on Jonah. It said who 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 is causing this problem. And it didn't lie. It did not lie, as most of them don't. So they pinpointed the problem. And Jonah says, throw me over. I, yep, it's me. I'm the one. Throw me over. Once you throw me over, uh, the waves will, will stop and you'll be able to get to your destination. But the people were so righteous in heart because they could have just said, throw them over. How many people wouldn't have nowadays? just so that, that, that their will could be done and not any not care at all about Jonah and his situation. But they didn't do that. They tried to continue to row the boat and move the boat to safety, but they couldn't. They didn't have any choice but to throw him over. And the Bible describes this. See, whenever the Bible describes something like this in, those, in, in the form of these people 
looking to row the boat and, and try to keep Jonah on the boat is there for a reason. Because they would have skipped over this. The Bible skips over a lot of stuff that we have to really kind of paint a picture on in the mind uh, into the scenario. But the Bible speaks to this as to the heart of the people on the boat. They were not wicked people. And this is one of the reasons why God didn't allow the boat to, to break up or to fall apart or anyone on the boat to be harmed. Seems like they were fundamentally righteous or there were some that were on there that were fundamentally righteous at heart. So God saved those people. Nonetheless, they took them and cast them off into the sea. He ends, God had, God had already created a, something to capture Jonah once he fell into the water because that was the reason why God created the raging in the water is to get Jonah off the boat. So God was already prepared for this. There was always already something prepared for Jonah to, to land in once he jumped out of that boat and fell into the water. I want to hop over until... Um, Chapter three. So, so Jonah ends up in the belly of the fish. He prays, he repents. He, he, he is in a point, he's at a point of so much fear and so much panic that he goes and he faces the God within him and he makes a vow. He makes a promise. He binds himself. He makes a covenant. And if you want to call it that to the God within him, to God and God allows him God gives him access out of the boat. He lands on dry land and God says, go to Nineveh because there's a lot of, a lot of uh, crying out to me in Nineveh. I want you to go to Nineveh and speak my word to the people in Nineveh. Nineveh. So, so Jonah's mind at this point is pretty much saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do what God wants me to do. I'm going to be a prophet or ambassador of God in the earth. And he's probably basing his idea or perspective of that on all of those great ones that came before him. And he's saying, you ever been in a situation where you're posed with two roads and you're like, okay, I want to go down this road. This is the road that I was really wanting to go down, road A. But God sends another road in your life and you see it and it's appeared. And you're like, dang, I don't really want to go down that road. I want to go down road A, but... Looks like everything is leading me down road B and you fight it with all you can. You fight it. You don't want to, you don't want to go down road B. You really want to go down road A and you're going to exhaust everything you can in implementing activities to keep you going down road A. While life is constantly telling you road B is the place to be. This is for you. And it takes something drastic, chaotic to get you on road B. And then you get on road B, you make an agreement, you make a promise because of something drastic that happened while you were, you know, pondering road A and you, you, now you're like, okay, I, God, if you get me, if, 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 if this is your will for me, I promise I'll do it. Just, you know, whatever your requirement is, do that. And I will do this. And now you're pondering road B. And you expect road B to be like it was for everybody that you saw pondering road B. Right? You, you expect road B to be with ease and tranquility as you would have expected to experience on road A. And it's not. And this is what happens to Jonah. Jonah comes to terms and he says, okay, I'm going to go and be your ambassador in the earth. I'm going to go be your prophet like all of the other great ambassadors and all the great prophets that you used in the past. And I'm going to go into Nineveh and I'm going to proclaim what you tell me to proclaim in Nineveh. And he does it. And he goes and he tells the people of Nineveh what God says. And the people of Nineveh immediately began to repent and align themselves. They began to fast, they began to repent, and they began to do all that they need to do to fall back into alignment with God and have the mercies of God. 
So much so that when word gets to the king of Nineveh, the king of Nineveh falls in alignment too. So the king didn't even have to declare it. Once the people heard it from Jonah, they immediately took it upon themselves to fall in alignment with God. So much so that when the king heard it, the king immediately began to do the same thing. Holding God accountable. And God saying, okay, wow, I see what this is. I'm going to spare these people. I'm not going to let my wrath prevail upon these people because they've taken upon themselves to straighten themselves out without me having to even punish them. Just from them getting a word from my servant, they've immediately stopped what they're doing and, and fallen in alignment. So I have nothing to really punish them for at this point. And Jonah is upset. And many will say, well, I wonder why Jonah is upset. I mean, you would think Jonah would be happy. But Jonah's upset because Jonah expected himself to ponder plan B and be great and monumental and go forward and have himself as a vessel of God in the earth saying unto all the nations, not just Nineveh, the proclamations of God and seeing them come to pass. And in the instance of doing that, in the act of doing that, it somehow would make Jonah possibly feel as if he was God. One could say that legitimately. Why else would he be upset? It says here in chapter four, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore, I fled before unto tarnish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. You mean to tell me that's all that got you? That's it? Take away my life because you have gone into the city and done the will of God and that which God told you to do God, by way of the actions of the people, did not do it. See, you got to know, you have to look into the climate of the time as well. See, there is no TV at that time. There is no TV. There is no social media. Everything had a spiritual foundation. So when Jonah went into the city and proclaimed all these things of God... I told you in previous Bible studies that these people could get stoned if you gave the wrong prophecy. They took it very seriously. It wasn't like in today you can come on social media saying this is going to happen and, you know, either you're in cahoots with the people that can actually make it happen and they, they just use you as a front man to go out and say, okay, this is probably going to happen and I'm a prophet and I'm saying all this stuff. And then those people uh, that hired you to do that actually make that happen. This wasn't that. Or this wasn't the type of thing where you go on social media and you say, oh, this is going to happen and it just never happens. All of that kind of stuff got you stoned. These people were not playing. Spirituality is a serious business. So much so that many people don't even really adhere to it. They don't. Many people are not spiritual. Many people are, you know, ritualistic. Because spirituality is serious business. It is, it is not a it's not something you want to be playing around with. When you make a vow, when you say you're going to do something, you got to you've got to do it. That that's that. That's why you you limit your agreements. That's why Jonah ran. Jonah ran because he knows how serious it is. Jonah, it, the Bible doesn't speak to Jonah's history. I don't know who Jonah was before this. But obviously Jonah is a very 
He understood the spiritual systems to the point that he respected it enough to leave. He tried to run away from his calling because he took it so seriously. And to the point that when God, he decided to let God use him, he based it, and I'm, I'm this is my interpretation, he based it upon all the great ones that had come before him. And he, 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 he became emotionally attached to it. Now he's not attached to it because of his love for God. He's attached to it because he wants to be great in the world as an ambassador of God. So he's thinking, I'm going to go into Nineveh and I'm going to proclaim all this stuff because God told me that he already knew what God wanted him to do in the beginning. He said it. God came to him and gave him direction in the beginning. The same thing God repeated the second time. It says here. Chapter three, verse one. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city and preach it unto Preach it unto preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So he already knew what God wanted him to do when he got on that boat. Go to Nineveh. He knew that. So he's on the boat, he's wrestling with it, he's thinking about it, and he's like, you know, I really don't want to do any of this. I want to do that. But if I do go to Nineveh, it looks like God is real serious about it because this boat is rocking. But I know God ain't gonna knock the knock this boat over. So you know, what What do I do when I go to Nineveh? Oh, okay, I could be great like Elijah. I could be great like Ezekiel. I can go into the people and people are going to be calling my name like Elijah and Ezekiel. Because that's what they were doing. All these people were great people. These were not peasants. These were great names in history. So Jonah is thinking he's going to be like that too. And he goes into Nineveh and the people adhere to repentance. And his words, his words work, but they work in a positive way. They don't work in the way where he can be the one that, ca that came unto those people and warned those people of God's wrath. And then God's wrath hit those people. And all they remember is God's wrath and Jonah. His name isn't remembered in that way. So God comes to Jonah. I'm going to wrap it up, y'all. God comes to Jonah. Before God comes to Jonah, he goes to he goes out of the city and he sits and he watches the city from a distance. And he's he's whining. He's whining, basically. He is. He's whining. He's saying, Man, God, I was doing, I was doing this one thing, and now God came to me, and I didn't even want to come out here with these people. But God, I tried to run from it, and God came to me anyway, only for only for it it, it to it to not do anything. He's he's not he's not looking at the goodness of it. He's not looking at wow, these people in Nineveh actually adhered to God's word and he they straightened themselves up. He's not he's not looking at that. He's looking at, wow, I came to Nineveh and told those people God was coming. And God didn't even destroy it. This is where Israel is at this time, y'all. This is how far Israel has fallen. And this is where they are. It is not about the righteousness. It's hard to find a righteous spirit in Israel completely to do God's will. But God must use vessels. And we're getting closer and closer to the part in this book where God goes silent. He don't use anyone. And Jonah is an example of why. Jonah, follow me, is an example of why God is going to go silent for 400, 400 years on these children. No word, no prophetic word, no vision, no nothing. Because these people have now gotten immersed in the wickedness. You are more popular by what you can do wicked than the good you're doing. Your name is great amongst Israel and the world for all of the wickedness you do. But if you do righteous and you do good, you are, 
nobody really wants to hear it. This is the major shift that has happened amongst the whole world and amongst Israel. And it's showing itself right here in Jonah. Right here. The prophets that God is using, the people that God is using are going forth with the intention of God showing his wrath and their name being associated with it. Them being the one that God used to be the footman in the world for him to warn the nations and to and to invoke his wrath. So, it says, Jonah went and sat up under a tree and uh, it doesn't say that it was hot, but it says that God created a... a, a a gourd. A gourd is a big fruit. It's a big fruit and it grows. I had to look it up. I didn't know what it was either. It's a big fruit and it grows really large. And it says that God created a, a, um, a gourd. And uh, it says, and he made it to come over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad. So the, the gourd was placed over Jonah because it was very hot where Jonah was sitting. And God gave him the gourd as a shadow to comfort him because this is a loving and, and a very benevolent God. But then God said, no, I, I can't. I can't always allow you to have the comforts. You've got to be able to know how to handle it without this gourd. I'm not always going to be able to make it comfortable for you. So in the same, the same one, one day God made the gourd to cover Jonah to give him relief after he went and he did God's will. And in the same day, God created a worm that came and ate the gourd up. So the next day the gourd was gone. It withered away. And Jonah's sitting out there with the sun beating on him. And God sent a wind that made the sun really, really hot on Jonah. To the point that he thought he was going to die. And Jonah was angry. That he didn't have the gourd anymore. And God came to Jonah and said. Well why are you angry that you don't have this shadow. This, this, this shadow of coolness anymore. Why are you angry that you don't have this gourd anymore. Giving you this shadow. Did you create the gourd? Did you plant it? Were you wise enough to grow these gourds to know that you would end up in this place to benefit from its shadow? Did you invest anything into the comfort that you're getting? Regardless of how long you had it, did you grow it? Did you plant it? Did you feed it? Did you till it? So why are you angry that it's no longer here? You did nothing to create it. But you're angry that it's here, that it's no longer here. And and God went as far to tell Jonah, "You're angry because I didn't destroy these people. Why are you angry that I didn't destroy these people? Do you not see that these people repented?" Why are you not happy that your brothers and your sisters have changed from their wicked ways and now are doing the righteous thing because of me sending you forward to them to speak my word? Why? And why do you think I should still condemn these people? Because of some idea you have in your head for some wicked philosophy that you've been sold on because the whole world is wicked at this point. And you want me to deliver a wrath upon these people, the same type of wrath that I've delivered upon many nations that would not turn from their ways. So what you're saying is you would rather these people to be like the nations that were stiff necked and that wouldn't adhere to my, to my calling or to my messengers. And it, and it ends with that question. It doesn't end with a resolution to it. It ends with those questions. And we enter into the book of Micah. 
These are the things, y'all. You know, a lot of times in life, you know, I, I, I'm learning more and more that, you know, there are many righteous people in the world. I know this for sure. But a lot of times when we get a little bit of power, when we get a little bit of knowledge, we think we are all powerful and we're not. We would rather use our power for wickedness than to use our power to bless somebody. We will sit up all times of the night meddling, doing wickedness to see if it'll work. Wonder if this will work if I do this. Wonder if that'll work if I do that. Wonder if this will work if I do this. When you can use that same level of energy to bless somebody. This is a perfect example of that. Jonah was called upon God because Jonah, God found Jonah useful. Jonah ran from it because Jonah knew how serious a calling of God is. He ran from it. And while he was on his run and while he was resting in the boat, he was thinking, okay, I might need to just go on ahead and do this. And now I'm going to change my, my thought process from what I was thinking of before God came to now what God is wanting me to do. I know exactly what he wants me to do because he told me it when he came to me. And I ran from it. And I'm thinking, okay, now if I go into Nineveh, I could be like those great ones. Not, not I can go into Nineveh and I could actually help my people. I could actually plead with these people to get them to change their ways. But I'm going to go into Nineveh and I'm going to be, I'm going to be speaking wrath. I'm going to make my name big by speaking wrath. I'm going to make my name big because God is going to use me to invoke his wrath upon people. Only for God, only for those people to repent and for God to use Jonah to make those people repent and for Jonah to know that and for Jonah to show his true self. That's exactly what happened. Jonah was led there by God for God to show Jonah Jonah. And he used that scenario to do it. That was to show Jonah, Jonah. How many people, I just did something yesterday about this same thing. How many people in the world do we know that God uses for whatever reason and they end up seeing themselves in that situation? It could be a situation geared for somebody else. They they may think that they're they're doing they're doing a, a, a service to somebody else. But the whole time they're showing you them. This is the Jonah situation. All day long. We're gonna call those situations Jonah situations moving forward. That's what I'm gonna call them. Jonah situations. People that that wanna wanna try and convict other people. But they end up they end up showing themselves. Showing weaknesses that they need to correct within themselves. Those are Jonah's situations, friend. I'm here to tell you. And we all know them. We some of us, they, they may be us. They're Jonah situations. Situations when you are going into it to convict somebody else or condemn somebody else for struggles that they may have that they may not even know are sins, that they may not even know that they're doing that's out of alignment. And you come upon them and they immediately try to fix their thing or, or, or straighten it out in some way. And you're angry because they're trying to fix it and that you can't condemn them. 
showing your nature, showing your heart. Those are Jonah's situations. This chapter ends with questions. It didn't end with any answers, but they surely led us to a realization of how these situations manifest themselves, how they show up in life. And I know all of us can relate to them. The Jonah situations of life. The Jonahs of life. The ones that can come in and be the messengers of God. Can paint the pictures of, 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 of what you're doing wrong. without them even knowing you. And then for you to see it and you to immediately begin to do things to align yourself back properly and them being mad that God hasn't destroyed you because of it. Them being angry that people love you even more because of it. Them being mad because you can overcome. Yet they're the ones that portray themselves as helpers. How are you a helper, Jonah? When you want to destroy these people. How are you a brethren? How are you an ambassador of God in the world when you want to destroy these people? You would rather these people be ostracized and set apart in a negative way, condemned. And you go and you sit outside of the city and you pout. You distance yourself because you can't, you can't take it. You're looking from a distance and you're disappointed that, that the people are not destroyed. These same people God sent you to help, to encourage, to straighten themselves up. But you got lost in the negatives. You wanted God to destroy these people. And you wanted your name associated with it. Amongst the nations. God's moving through me on this one today. I'm here to tell you. All is well. This is my Bible study for y'all today. You love more than you love. And no, I never stop telling you. God will meet you right where you at, friend. All you have to do is keep going. There is no perfection. There is righteousness of heart. Keep your hands clean and your heart righteous. Keep your heart light. And keep going. You love. Peace and love.